So far, over 10 million Americans have lost their jobs because of government mandated shutdowns in response to the coronavirus. How many people is that? Well, it's more than live in New York City. There are 41 American states with total populations smaller than this group of newly jobless workers. Take a look at this graph of unemployment claims from the Department of Labor. Now, we don't use a lot of graphs on this show. This one will give you a sense of how unusual this event is. Don't read the numbers. Just look at the line at the bottom. You'll see a fairly straight line with some bumps that ends with a sharply steep spike. That spike is right now. Now, the timeline you're looking at extends over 53 years. When the government began measuring unemployment claims, the Vietnam War was still a full year from its peak. We've weathered a lot of traumatic events since then, the 1973 oil shock, the 9-11 attacks, the collapse of our industrial economy, countless other frightening moments. Nothing, none of this came remotely close to the economic effect the coronavirus shutdowns have had on America already. Now, the scale of this hasn't quite registered yet. Our leaders still seem far more afraid of a virus that probably kills fewer than 1% of those infected than the prospect of a third of all Americans losing their jobs. We don't judge anyone for that. There's something uniquely panic-inducing about infectious disease. The fear of it is atavistic. It's in our bones. We're born with it. But still, this is a moment it will pass. A year from now, what will seem scarier, the Chinese coronavirus or the economic devastation it wrought? It's worth thinking about that as we move forward. But we can't. Thinking about things like that has been cast as a kind of moral crime by our opinion-making class. Last week, we did a segment with Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Dan Patrick. Patrick is 70 years old, and he has the kind of health profile that makes him especially vulnerable to this virus. Like most people in his position, he's worried about being infected. You would be, too. He doesn't want to get sick or die. But he also has other worries. He doesn't want to see America destroyed. He wants his grandchildren to grow up in the same kind of country that he did, prosperous, stable, employed. He said all of that on our show last Monday. And almost immediately, the media outrage machine began belching smoke and making loud noises. Dan Patrick is telling old people to die for the stock market, they screamed. No, Dan Patrick was not doing that. Not even close. He didn't say anything like that on the air, and that's not what he meant. But it didn't matter. Patrick was vilified in dozens of news stories as if he was trying to kill the elderly in order to, in order to boost Exxon share price. In an environment like this one, where reactive, emotionally incontinent people have the loudest megaphones, it's nearly impossible to see clearly or make wise decisions. That's true of everyone, and particularly everyone in power, even our most impressive and thoughtful officials. At yesterday's coronavirus briefing, Dr. Anthony Fauci was asked when the restrictions on normal life will end in this country. Here's how he replied. If we get to the part of the curve that uh, Dr. Burke showed, yesterday when it goes down to essentially no new cases, no deaths at a period of time. So it'll be fixed when we have no new cases and no deaths. How long will that be? Almost nobody thought to ask. We've got to beat this disease. Details are irrelevant. Cost is no object. That's the feeling in Washington right now and certainly in the press corps that covers it. But details are always relevant. And there's always a limit to what we can pay. That's always true. Decisions we make today will echo for decades. They could radically change the future of this country. We need to try harder to keep perspective and to remain persistently open-minded in the face of this. What would have happened, for example, if we'd adopted a more conventional response to this epidemic? What if we'd asked the elderly and the immunocompromised and anyone else facing statistically higher rates of risk to stay inside, closer to away? And then at the same time, allow the rest of the population to use informed common sense and continue to work. What if we'd done that a month ago? Would the death rate today be much higher than it is now? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But it's clearly a conversation we should have had before we locked the entire country down and put 10 million people out of work. But we didn't have that conversation. Instead, we outsourced the decision to public health officials. And that's a strange irony of the moment we're living through. One of the main lessons of this crisis is that the public health establishment failed us badly. The World Health Organization colluded with the Chinese government to lie about critically relevant facts during the early days of the outbreak. Once the coronavirus reached our shores, the CDC couldn't seem to produce working tests. Those were disasters. Many people died because the people we trusted to protect our health didn't do it.
They've been thoroughly discredited. At the same time, though, we're being asked to trust these same people without hesitation, and for the most part, we are doing that. In other words, the experts failed, yet the experts now have more power than ever before. It's bewildering. In fact, it's reminiscent of 2008, when reckless behavior by the banks crippled the economy and crushed the middle class. But when it came time to fix it, we put bankers in charge of the cleanup. Now, this is not an argument against expertise. It's not even a populist argument. Of course, bankers understand finance. Epidemiologists understand coronavirus far more than most people do. So turning to experts in crisis makes sense, and we should, and hopefully we always will.